everybody happy new year it's 2021 and of, and of course you know the archbishop doesn't want to keep you all waiting so he wants to continue his conversations so we are conversating again for 2021 and his grace is here with us happy new year archbishop charles jason gordon happy new year reverend deacon derek walker it, it, it's lovely to have you in your corner. It's lovely that you you should make yourself available to speak to your, you know, your flock this year. Well, you know, that's my that's my thing. I want to be available to people and really conversate on the conversations that are happening in the in the time in that we're in. How you like that sentence? A lot of boy, that sentence was boy. Ha, huh? that was COVID strong. <laughs> <laughs> As we're talking about COVID and so on, you know, your your conversation with us, you know, till and keep to heal our soul wound. Now that that you, you kind of struck me there, you know how so to till and keep our soul wound. So no, no, no. It, to till it, and keep to yes. heal our soul wound. Right, right. I've got it. I got it. Forgetting uh, yes. the operative verb is to heal. The, to heal, you know, and but you're talking about well, just in that sentence alone, till and keep to heal our soul wound. You must be asking us about caring. So how do we build then that culture of care? You know that my hope for 2021 is that we could all work together to build a culture of care. You know our families, our parishes, our workplaces, our national community, that we, we will start exhibiting extreme hospitality, as you would put it, extreme <laughs> hospitality. And well, that would be for me a major hope for this year, but I also believe it would be a vital gift for Trinidad and Tobago. Well, you know, I We've been pretty generous. Eh? Um, I think that the people of Trinidad and Tobago, especially for this whole, the whole of 2020, have been extremely generous. I don't see 2021, you know, getting any easier. I think that, you know, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, a, a friend of mine says, he hopes they don't get, um, you know, they don't get this burnout in terms of them giving. Generosity fatigue. Gener yeah, you got it. Generosity party. It's calling for extreme generosity. Extreme, extreme. generosity. Yeah. You see, whenever there's been a crisis, the people of Trinidad and Tobago have done extreme and extremely well in the response to that crisis. So if you, if you think of, of um, things like Dominica, you know, we, we've done really well there. I mean, I can't tell you how many containers left Trinidad for Dominica when we had the, when they had the two hurricanes back to back. Antigua, I mean, the number of containers that went to Antigua. Even Bahamas, the kind of support we gave to Bahamas after they had their last major disaster. And, and if you take 2020, <coughs> when we had that, that um, time, those four months where you know, people were just not working, the kind of generosity that people showed was, was really, really incredible, wonderful, extreme, amazing, tremendous. I don't have words to describe the kind of generosity I saw and, and, and the impact that that had on me and, and on many, many people. I mean, there were people making sandwiches, 
that I think they're still making sandwiches, everyday sandwiches went downtown to, to families that were in deep need. Yeah. And, and nobody knew making these sandwiches, you know. They just had groups of people coordinated by somebody at sandwiches, which just get dropped off and delivered. So that kind of generosity is, is really amazing. But at the same time that we're so generous, we could be really brutal to one another, you know, especially in our families, among our friends. And, and this, this state of affairs, I think, is crippling our people. And it's really hindering the true progress of our nation. Because is this, this dichotomy. Yeah, yeah. Is this what you're talking about in terms of our soul wound that we need to heal? Um, this soul wound, you know, we need to till and keep to heal our soul wound. Are you seeing that's where we, we are wounded and why we are so hard on each other sometimes? Well, you know, there's a concept called the soul wound. Just as individuals have um, areas in their life that they need to be, to be healed of, psychological areas or physical, so to a nation has a, a wound, and, and that wound I'll call a soul wound. Um, it's the area of life that keeps recurring despite the best efforts of people. So uh, I don't know about your life, but uh, in my life, there are areas that no matter how hard I try, it just comes back and back and you get fed up of it and you say, okay, Lord, um, or go, when, when? Right, but in a in 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 nation, a similar thing happens. There's some recurring areas that when, when we are with the back pressed against the wall, they, they emerge again and again and again. Despite mm -hmm. our best efforts, the wound really cripples us and, and causes deep trouble. So this pattern of behavior really betrays the deep pain and the deep trauma in our society. The soul wound. Archbishop J is saying we need to heal our soul wound. We need to till and keep to heal our soul wound. We want to we want to walk with him through this conversation because it affects all of us in the Caribbean. I think it affects all of us in the world, but we have a deeper wound in the Caribbean. And what is the you know why is it so persistent? So there's a there's a um, there's a psychologist who's done work with the Native American peoples, and uh, he's he's coined this term soul wound, and he's he said you know it is when a people experience extreme trauma, that extreme trauma creates a response that is a soul wound, and until there is healing the manifestation of that wound does not get better. So that, that notion of a soul wound is an important notion because it, it really helps you to see that it is not people being bad or foolish or stupid. This is really the illness, the psychic illness of a people. So I call the manifestation soul wound based on this work from the the psychologists with the, with the First Nations. It is persistent and it undermines in the most pernicious way possible. It is a dark underbelly that we do not see easily. Neither do we understand its destructive powers on us. And an individual or a nation in the grip of a soul wound is on a path of destruction. So let me unpack that a little bit. You know, there are some people that when they go into challenge, they might start to drink. Yeah. Some people they go into challenge, they become angry. Some people when they when they challenge, they, they do all kind of destructive behaviors. And and that's the person in the deepest wound. Now, when a person is in their deepest wound, what do they need? They don't need shame and they don't need um, exposure, 
exposition. What they really need is love. And what they really need is acceptance. Because it's only unconditional love actually helps to unravel the soul wound and cover it with, with, a, with, with, with a love and a, and a, and a, and a healing balm. And, and so the, the way that the wound is, it, it is persistent. It, it really undermines, it's pernicious. It, it gets into every space that is destructive. And, and I believe that the manifestation of the soul wound in Trinidad and Tobago is, is really seen in this relationship in the family. Where, where we can be fairly brutal or give extreme license to our children and to each other. And, and that sets a foundation for relationship, which really is not a great foundation for the future of your nation. Because if the family is the load bearing wall of civilization and the destructive elements are happening inside of the family, then we're going to take this on to the next generation and we're perpetuating the soul wound generation after generation. You know, Archbishop G, I like how you're talking, you know, but you, you, this is years, probably centuries of a type of culture, a negative type of culture that has us trapped, you know, and, and, and it's going to be difficult for us to, 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 reshape our thinking, our behavior. I mean, especially when you, you just mentioned, um, you know, our whole, the cutting humor that we have. You're saying, well, a man with a cutting humor who calling your big head or, or, or giving you, you know, that kind yes. of treating you that way. To be, to be able to, to, to treat him, to treat him with love. It's kind of hard, you know, because I only look at giving back just what he gave to me. Well, and that's, that's what we become proficient in. Um, see, when I look at Trinidad and Tobago, I see an enormous devastating wound that undermines us at so many turns. It is revealed in how we relate to each other, in the home, in the family setting, our jokes, the cutting humor, as you are speaking about, pressing somehow as passing some hours an expression of love and care. You know, the people that we love the most is the people that we give the, the most cutting humor to. Eh? <laughs> we tear them down to tears in front of everybody else. And that's because we love them. Eh? That's because <laughs> that's the show love. Eh? You know, something is wrong, but it breeds discontent in our own skin and, and perpetuates a deep sense of inferiority. When, when, a, when a child growing up in a family starts to, to put on a little weight, and next thing, that child being called fatty. No, 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 I have I'm, I'm another, I'm another one. Sometimes they call you chunkalungs, you know? Chunkalungs. Big thing, you know? <laughs> I mean, and, and, and the thing that the person is most ashamed of is the name by which we will call them. So, so they have to grow a, a very thick skin just to survive, eh? Just to survive. And so the, 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 the way the wound works, you know, partners that the down the line, you see them for a long time. Well, the ritual of cutting people down to size before you settle down and laugh properly. <laughs> Is is unreal. It's unreal. Our our language to each other is very brutal, you know. Yes. I don't know if you've ever stopped and thought about the language we have to each other. I listen, I grew up with five brothers, you know, or four brothers, you know, you know, right. and, and partners, and everybody, you know, is normal. What we call in Trinidad and Tobago, P Kong. You understand? You're yes. going to get, you know, big head, you know, and all the things that go with that, you know, roly poly, 
you know, um, oh my goodness, I it, we can't continue with this on 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 air. But we all know as Trinidadians and Tobagonians the kind of names that we call each other. Yes. But but the the worst part of it is we do that under the guise of love. Eh? Is your partner? So you call him, you know. You do and, that under the guise of love. But it's around the dinner table. It's in the car going to school. It is everywhere. It's in the classroom. Well, let's just get names in our classroom just so you know. Hold on. And it remains with you for the rest of your life. For your life. For your life. But but it is that negativity, that um that deep negativity really it it i i believe it, it undermines and it creates a sense of inferiority and it, it also leaves people believing that that they they really aren't good enough so because it's it is really giving in your own skin it is giving people a sense of, of not of, of not being good enough and of shaming people publicly. Yeah. And we good at it. Yeah, we good, we good, we good. And it, and it even gets, it, it even goes down to our children at home and how we speak to our children. And I mean, yeah. as a, I have to plead guilty for the many times that I have hurt my own children in terms of trying to correct them, trying to help. I want to use the word, doing more of you trying to help them. And I'm using negative ways of helping them. And that's what I'm talking about. It is, it is all under love, eh? it's all under love and help and care. But, it, it, but it's actually undermining and, and doing a job on, on our young that is creating a, a, a deep sense of insecurity so that we don't allow people to grow in their own skin and feel at home. And if you have witnessed, you talked about the correcting of the children. What about the names that, that, we, that we give them? Just to point out their faults and their, their, their shortcomings. You know, a, a child do some piece of foolishness. Well, every auntie who come home have to hear the whole story over and over again. And the child had to listen one more time to being shamed at. Right. One more time. And every auntie who come home, that child get his story dragged one more time. Yeah. And you could believe this child. And, and well, is that really necessary? Hmm. Now, why do we do it? I think we actually do it because we have this mistaken belief that a child only improves when you point out their failures to them with minute detail. Thank God. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I really think so. That, that somehow in the back of our mind, <coughs> we believe that <coughs> when we shame a child, that then the child will, will do better. Because if I can get them publicly to acknowledge their faults and shortcomings, that child will do better. Somehow we believe that there is no scientific proof of that whatsoever. In fact, I think the opposite is true. Yeah, the opposite is true, Archbishop J. It's called um, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because yeah. some we, we, you will never amount to anything. You don't see, you know, things like that. I mean, and you know, one of the things that we both share is, you know, dyslexia. And it really was not recognized as what it is, um, let's just say 20, 30 years ago. So you yeah. have a generation that's coming up and they may have been struggling with reading or writing or something like that. And it was not their, not, not their fault, but they got they done see. You're they done see. Done see. You're hard head. Hard yes. Hard head. I mean, yes. had every, every man of description shown at you. I mean, I remember my classic report card, my, my best ever. Jason is a nice boy, illiterate, but a nice boy. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> are you in one, 
we will not go into we will not go into mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's my most memorable report card. Illiterate. That was what I was called. Illiterate. Yes. You know. Yes. Now, and the teacher thought that they were doing very good by pointing out my areas for improvement that I needed to become literate. So by calling me illiterate, it, it was really the only way to help me to do better. Pressure. Pressure. But that, that the manner of thinking is really what is important. How, how is it possible? How is it possible that in 2021, we still believe that, that by pointing out children's faults to them, or spouses falls for them for that matter, how do we still believe in 2021 that that somehow is a magic bullet that will help a person improve their lot and their life? How is that possible? I, I, I don't have an answer, but all I can say is that it has been so culturally ingrained in us, it's going to take a generation or two with us acknowledging that this is a, a problem and we have to be educated and they say culture takes 18 months to really change, to change a culture. But that's if we, we, we educate people that, hey, this is, this is a, a serious problem, you know, and we need to, we need to, to, to help and educate our people that no, this is, if you want to, if you want to help, this is not the way to help, not to pull down, not to destroy. Yeah. It's, it's, um, but, but it's, it is so crazy, you know, it's real crazy. Yeah? Because when you think of how we do it, we, we, we really do crazy. But what has happened now, I think, based on the experience of people growing up, being shaped, and being told how bad they are and being publicly humiliated. Now we have the flip side, eh? Now, now, yeah, we, we, yeah, yeah. we got to the flip side, you're we saying, flip, eh? We flip that. Now, what we do is, is so different. Even if the children are doing really, really bad, they have to be protected from the truth. <laughs> and, and, you know, they... they Every child must get a merit badge or must, must get something to tell them that they're doing really, really good. Even if they're doing really, really bad. All right? They, they're lied to and their, their potential is exaggerated and we're setting them up for failure because they give them a false sense of themselves and, and that is, is as bad as the first one. Because this parent remember how it felt when they had a bad grade and the parent carry on, they come, they, 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 the great slip come home. Oh, darling, don't worry. Look, you still did okay in English. <laughs> you might have barely passed, eh? but, but we, we are now trying to point out the, the absolute positive and exaggerate the, the, the grit and, and the, the, the sense of that person, which, which is another form of lie. I'm hearing you, um, but I wanna throw this in so that it, it, it makes it, it's more understandable for those who are listening because maybe that little scamp wasn't studying at all. So it's not a, it's not a situation where, you know, he has a serious problem and therefore you're not, but he is, um, he was, he was on WhatsApp, he was on YouTube, he was on TikTok. But, but, and you not make him, but now you make him entitled, Correct. believing that he's the best thing since sliced bread, barely passing any subjects. Correct. And, and it's just a matter of indiscipline and you not being the parent that you should be. But, but you are not, but also by, by, by telling him now that he's the best thing since sliced bread, you are actually emboldening him to mediocrity. Now, when he goes out in the world of work and the first person gives him a critical review and tell him he's lazy, he is he, not acting well, he's not being appropriate in the job place, well, he gone to tears, eh? Hmm. So, and, and I'm saying that, that both sides of this, of this equation are bad. 
On the one hand, the cutting people down with negativity is terrible. But on the other hand, lying to people and making them feel they're much better than they actually are is also, is also terrible. Because that is a pamper generation that, that no one can, can, can correct or say anything to because all they're being told is how great they are. And, and that does not help a child either. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. Now I understand. Now I understand why you have till and keep. To yes. Steal. Because you had a till. You, you, you understand? You, 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 you have to dig it up till and, till and keep. Till no, no, no. All right, all right. No, 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 no. Hold on on the meaning of till for a little while. Now we come into the meaning of till. It's a technical term. You're going to be surprised where, where it come from. But it, we come in, we come in. The, the, there is a, a, a way of loving a child and giving feedback at the same time. There's a way of doing that. As opposed to berating a child or a person or a spouse or a friend, berating them, cutting them down and thinking that that is feedback. That is not feedback. Feedback would be, okay, Johnny, I've read through your report. Tell me what happened this term that your, your, your grades have dropped significantly from last year. What do you think has happened? It isn't, well, Johnny, you know you're the best thing since sliced bread. You know I love you dearly. And you don't worry about this, you know, because we would be okay next year. On the one hand, or... Boy, he's a dunce or what? I didn't make no duncey hard-headed child, you know. Oh, I... <laughs> I, I think there's, there's a, a middle road where we can love a child, where we can ask the right question and engage a child in, into reflection about what they need to do if they're going to do better this term than they did last term. And also appreciate whatever progress they made in, in this term as opposed to what they did before. I, I think we can, we can do that. And I think we are sophisticated enough as a nation to be able to do that and do it consistently well. Well, I wish us luck. <laughs> that no. is our reality. <laughs> I pray in luck. I wish it. I pray. In, I pray in luck. Wow, I wow. I pray in luck. You I mean, see, I... these two the undermining and the over-exaggeration, they're lethal cocktail. And in this way, the family is undermined and ultimately, we are not serving the next generation. Ultimately, the, the, they, they are unprepared. So if you look at, at um, a lot of the literature now on the millennials and the workplace, they're unprepared to receive honest feedback because they've either been lied to on the one hand or they've been shamed on the other. And, and both have the same reaction, which is a, a inability to receive, respond, and grow. A paralysis, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a paralysis at, at the core and heart. And, and that paralysis is, is really what, what is, is, has wounded our country in a, in a fundamental way. Why you gotta have serious emotional intelligence to be able to deal with this. I, I want to say that you have to have emotional intelligence, you know? So no, you, you need to be on your knees to deal with this. <laughs> this is emotional intelligence, you know? This is a job not for the head or the heart, you know? This one, this for the knees. This for the knees. This yeah. job, this job is, is located in the knees. All right, I've got to say something. Some is for the head, something is for the heart. Uh -uh. Yeah, they said this is. one for the knees. All right, I, I, I'll, I'll remind sometimes I tell my congregation, get down and do some knee mail. You know, you want to communicate with the Lord, get down and do some knee mail. This is for this is a knee mail. This is for knee mail. Knee mail. This is for knee mail. Yeah. You see, there is an impact that we're not seeing, eh? Both the hypercritical and the exaggerated inflation undermines a child, but it also undermines a family. And ultimately, it is undermining the nation. 
the family is supposed to give the child the core values and that inner sense of stability to know his or her place in the world and to experience what it is to be at home in one's skin. That's what the family is supposed to do. So when, when in the family, which is supposed to be the school of love, you're either having the school of shame or you're having the school of indulgence, then you're, you're, the family is really setting up the child and the nation for serious trouble, really serious. But this is why I'm calling this a soul wound because this is not just about individual parents or individual human beings, individual spouses. This is a national crisis that we're facing. And, and I, am, I am more and more convinced that the, that the crisis comes from a deep place of our, of our own um, wound and wounded psyche because, because of slavery and because of indentation. And, and that the, the historic wound and trauma that we're carrying has never been faced. You know, we have, we have never had people face us as, you know, for, for what your ancestors went through, we sorry. It was wrong. That's right. That's never happened, you know. And a person can't move on unless somebody takes responsibility for doing the wrong that they've done. And that's all a person usually needs, but a nation needs that too. A nation also needs that. Oh, well, you, you, you just struck a chord there um, because I think that there have been many people asking for it. You know, I mean, I, I was something beautiful in John Paul II, St. John Paul II. He, yes. actually, he actually said, please forgive us. We are sorry for what yes. as church we have done, but we've never heard it from the colonizers. No. Now, during the, the lead up to the millennium, um, John Paul did his, I think it was seven mea culpas. Yeah. I am sorry, on behalf of the church. I know that Archbishop Pandit did a mea culpa here on behalf of the church when um, in the lead up to the, to the year 2000. Last year, you might remember, for the 50th anniversary of the Black Power Revolution, and the 50th anniversary of the Black Power Movement entering the cathedral, I did a mea culpa in the cathedral and, and said sorry on behalf of the church and, and all of my predecessors. I am sorry that we have not treated you as we should have. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's important because healing only starts happening when people take responsibility. And, and wow. that's that's a serious piece, eh? Wow. When we when we are able to to do this thing right, you know, not the hypocritical and, and not the inflated, then the nation will flourish because its citizens will be at home in their own skin and, and they can then stretch stretch further for the sake of the other. So we can we are great at dealing with the other. That is not in our own space. Yeah. A damsel in distress is a, yeah. is a cry of the heart that, that we will just go and help. That, that's that's kind of how we made up. Um, mm -hmm. And any nation of people in distress in the region, we stretch real far to help. We really have, you know. It's, it's not... Is not the people who are outside of our space. It's the people inside of our space where the real distress is at. Um, your, your predecessor used to say, we are, we are angels on the street, but devils in the home. Well, boy, <laughs> that is a good saying. <laughs> yes. And, and, and that being at home in our own skin is, is undermined every time a generation chooses to do parenting either by the shaming and the, and the criticism or by the inflation. It's, it's undermining a generation. And that undermine is what we're paying a price for. And this is what is necessary for human flourishing. 
and for giving this sense of care to others who are most in need. And then until we can do that in the home, we're not going to be able to become the nation we need to be. You're taking us deeper into this nation thing now, because if we can't get it right in the home, then the effects will be seen in the nation. Yes. So ask yourself some questions now. Why is cor corruption so rife in our nation? Why? Or, or why are we so hungry for attention to social acceptability? Everybody wants to socially climb and arrive. That is, that is a national pastime. And, and you know, they have a, a term for it, you know, is the crab in the barrel syndrome. And you know about crab. <laughs> you I know about crab. Crab in a barrel. Every crab pulling down the crab that's starting to climb, they get pulled down for, for, for the next one to climb on top of the back. So the crab in the barrel syndrome is, is really a national pastime. That anybody who achieves and does good, they have to get pulled down because we can't allow anybody to, to be flourishing at all. So, you know, why is our sexual energy so out of control so early in, our, in adolescence in our, in our youth? Why? I see other nations that don't do it that way. You know, but, but for, in our country, you know, real early, real, real early. And I think that these are, these are the wounds, you know, these are the signs of the deep soul. You say these, signs. Are the manifest, these are the manifestations. These are the way that the wound is manifested. I'll tell you why I think so. And I debated this long and hard in my own head, you know. And I'm still open to, to, to hearing alternative positions. But my, my, the reason why we, are, why we are so corrupt is because we don't have a sense of, of, of stability inside of our own skin. And we believe that the only way we will ever be secured is if we amass more money than four generations need. And even then we still are sure, eh? Even then we still are sure. There are people who have more money than God and are still corrupt. And when, you, you, can't, you can't have for 10 generations, man. That's not necessary. Three generations is plenty. Or, or the, the, the social acceptability. Why, why are we so hungry for social acceptability? I think it's because, again, in our own skin, we know ourselves to be brutish. And, and, and because in our own skin, we are not acceptable to us because we have not been accepted by the people who are most important to us, our family, we, we lap up social acceptability because we, we're taking it any way we could get it. Are you saying that is why we want to get all the likes we can on Facebook and, yeah, and yeah, 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 Instagram yeah, yeah. And, and all these yeah, things? Yeah, 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 yeah. All of that. All of that. All of that. That's a all, deep all, kind of family wound there, you know? All of that is part of it. And, and, then, and then the sexuality. And I'll go into that in a little while. But because in, in, the, in the sexuality, again, it's, it's, it's just this raw energy that has no container. And, and that, that we, we really have to see how, how we can um, live this in a way that is, that is more whole. But, but that starts in the home too, because if you're not at home in your own skin, then, then any stimulation from outside of you makes you feel, okay, I must be really a man, or I must be really a woman. And, and, and that undermines the society also. So these are, these are some of the, the things, you know, and, and while it, ex, it is expressed on the level of the individual, I believe it's lived out in a collective way and it's lived out on the national stage. Look at Carnival. Look at Carnival. Carnival has become a pagan festival. And, and, and the, 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 um, the wildness, the wildness and the raw expression of, of obscenity on the national stage and the fixation of the camera with it is both the people acting out and the camera person and the editor and the person calling the shots, all of them in collusion 
to, to portray this thing in, in, in the living rooms of, of the nation. And, and, and something have to be wrong, you know. Wait, 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 wait. Something <laughs> have to be hold, wrong. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, how many ways that was? <laughs> <laughs> how long, how long you, this, you've been mulling over this? I mean, this thing just couldn't come up last week. Well, you know, as a man, I think, eh? And I've been mulling over this for a while now. But over the Christmas time, and because the Holy Father wrote his, his, um, his document for World Day of Peace on a culture of care, it has provoked the thinking again. How do we build a culture of care? And then I, I applied it not to the international, which, um, which is where it was cast. And, and he had a lot of other examples. But I tried to go right down to the particular and to the place of pain that, that, is, that is evident from my perspective, where if we could get to that place of pain, we could actually become an incredible nation. You name this thing. These are all signs of the deep father wound that exists in our nation. You actually named it. Yes. And I'm calling it a father wound. I'm calling it a father wound. And I'll tell you why I call it a father wound too. You see, so his, the Holy Father in his, his, in his message talks about building the culture of care. And, and I believe it's, it's something that is beautiful and incredible for our nation. But, but I believe that unless we understand its source and its pain point, that we, we, we're not gonna move it forward because we always start by building a culture of care outwards. I think we have to start it in the family. And, and that's why I'm starting where I'm starting in 2021. Now, now you might say I come out in 2021 and I'm not even happy with a googly. Is a Chinaman I given on you? You might say that. <laughs> but but the I blame in the Holy Father. He, you believe in no your right? Father? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had no right to name 2021 World Day for Peace, building a culture care. He had no right to do that. So it's his fault, not mine. It's his fault. <laughs> and then on, on top of he gives us he gives us Saint Joseph as the model. So you talk about the father wound. What? Yeah. My yes. Goodness. Yes. You see, when the family has a culture of care that is passed from generation to generation, what will happen is we we'll change the great wound in our national life. And it will bring about a resilience and it will bring about a flourishing within our, within our society. Just think on one, on one thing, corruption. Just think on that alone. The amount of, of, of the national patrimony that has been, been siphoned off by deals that could have gone to health could have gone to education, could have gone to nation building, could have gone to so many things, but, but it's gone siphoned off into um, individual benefit. Are you calling that now? <laughs> individual benefit. Why, why is it so prevalent? Why? Everything from, from your, your working license office and, and the temptation to get your business done is, is, is to do the business crooked. To a post office, to anywhere. Why is that, why is that so prevalent? I, I, I believe it's so prevalent because we, we are not at home in us and nothing we have will ever be enough. And so, so we would sell our soul for the sake of what we feel will secure us. We don't know that scripture passage, fool. One day, this horde of yours, whose will it be? Because your, your very soul is going to be in peril because of it. Okay. Now, at one point in, in the text of the Holy Father, he takes us to the book of Genesis. And he gives us the, the, the mandate to Adam. This is before the creation of Eden. 
So this is the, the, the mandate to the male, to the father. And, and the Holy Father says, in the Bible, the book of Genesis shows from its very first pages, the importance of the care or protection of God's plan for humanity. It highlights the relationship between man, Adam, and the earth, and among ourselves as brothers and sisters. In the biblical account of creation, God entrusts a garden planted in Eden to Adam's care. And, and the mandate to Adam's care to till and to keep it. Genesis 2.15. The verbs till and keep describes Adam's relationship to the garden home, but also the trust God placed in him by making him master and guardian of all creation. Okay? Till and keep, till and keep, till, till and, keep. and keep. Now, when you understand till and keep, this is Adam's task to till and to keep. Now to till is to engage in husbandry. You hear the word? Husbandry. <laughs> you, you hear any word, eh? Husband, no. I get it. The language itself <laughs> says, says everything, you know. When I, when, I, when I was fishing for the word and I said, but that's husbandry. <laughs> and, and, okay, good. But it, it, it evokes an intense attention to the cultivating and nurturing of the garden. A knowledge of just what crop to plant, where and just how to ensure all plants in the garden are flourishing in an integral ecosystem. This, this speaks about wisdom and learning from experimentation and from experience. And that's the role of the till. To till is, is a nurturing, a nurturing task. And this is the father's task to till the family, creating an integral ecosystem where each member is getting just the right nurturing and pruning that is appropriate in the right timing. And this speaks of a culture of care at the very heart of the family, a culture that is the task of mom and dad. And we often only believe that it is mom's role to nurture and dad's role to correct. But to dad has been given till yes. and keep, yeah. which is nurture, nurture and keep. The father is called to nurture and cultivate the earth and he's called to nurture and cultivate the family also. We're going to have to continue this conversation because, you know, we have such an absence of fathers in the family. I so agree. He has the big father wound. I agree. But, but when, it, when it continue on, you'll see why I'm hitting, and, and this is Joseph's year. Joseph. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aiming my dad's idly. <laughs> this, is, this is Joseph's year. And, and we have to call the fathers back to, to their responsibility. Because, you know, I joke, and he said once, this land could easily be called the land of the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> <laughs> easy, easy, easy. Because they have so many fatherless children <laughs> in this country that, that it had to be an Immaculate Conception. Had to be. <laughs> So don't get distracted by that last, last story comment. Don't get distracted. To keep now, on the other hand, is to protect. It is a protective task. It is to guard. It is to ensure boundaries are secure, to make safe and secure from harm. It is to ensure the family is protected from the, the predators of lust, greed, and pride. It is to ensure that the children and the spouse is completely completely at home in their own skin and at home in God. And you understand now where from the beginning now, when I'm talking about our lack of, a home, of at homeness and also the culture, the culture is really part of the father womb. The whole culture I'm speaking to is really a part of the father womb because the, the father is supposed to protect and give the boundaries. 
but, but when when the home has no boundaries, and 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 by the way, calling a child is putting on a little bit of weight, fatty in front of a crowd is is really a lack of boundaries. That's what it is. It's a lack of or calling a child dunsy because their report book was not good. That's a lack of boundaries. Telling a child that they're the best thing since sliced bread when they just fail all their exams and they have the capacity to do plenty better, that too is a lack of boundaries. And it's the father's role to till and to keep. To keep. And to keep is to give the boundaries. That's to give the boundaries. You see, in psychology, it is said that mom gives the fluid of the soul and that gives the container, boundaries, keep. Men, we need to set up and stand up to the task of Adam, to till and to keep the family. Then the family will have the container. Addictive living will be no more. And we will be content with what we have and corruption will simply die away in our society. I'm taking a deep breath. And I'm telling everybody there, go get your Catholic news. You could read it. You could meditate on what, it, what, what, what Archbishop is having this conversation with us all about. And I think for 2021, what a wonderful way to start. Fathers, by the way, um, wives, buy your husband the Catholic news. Eh? And give them to read. And tell them to watch the show. <laughs> Till and keep. Yes. Till and keep. You know, there was a book, my, my mother who fathered me. Well, you know, a mother can't father a child and a father can't mother a child. A mother can be an extremely good mother. A father can be an extremely good father. But, but the, the, the whole DNA is different. And, and, and therefore, that's why a child needs both a mom and a dad. Yeah. Needs both. But, but it needs a dad who is stepping up to the plate in being a dad who's hearing Adam's call and who is going and willing to live the mandate of the till and the keep that was given to the first man and through him to every man. Because when men are nurturing only, they're not doing the, yeah. the, the, the call of God. When mm -hmm. men are only in, 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 in certain boundaries, you don't do this, da -da 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 they're not doing the call of God. It, it, is, it is both nurturing and ensuring guarding and boundary keeping. That's when we could start talking about a man fulfilling his role in the kingdom and a man fulfilling his role in the family and a man fulfilling his role for the nation. And, and, and where that is not so, then we know the pain and the real challenge of the nation. We know it. And, and you only have to look at this country of ours to see where the, the father wound is evident in our nation. Just look at the country and see it. It's rife in our country. It really is. And, and that, is, that is really what I'm, 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 I'm starting off with. 2021, the year of St. Joseph. Men, 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 I'm begging you. Let us hear the biblical mandate to till and to keep. Because if we fulfill our role, then we will heal the soul wound of our nation. And, and, and why I'm connecting it, you see, the, the, the wounded masculinity is coming out of the experience of the plantation system, whether we like it or we don't like it. The, the, in the early studies of the slaves who were born in Africa, they had a far higher percentage of them living in a relationship of marriage and the, the, the slaves born in the, in the region, a much lower percentage of, of the women living in marriage. The matrifocal households came in in the, in the Caribbean because of the plantation system. It was brutally imposed because 
the slave owners broke up the families and they broke up the families because they were afraid of rebellion when, when a man felt that he had to protect his wife or his child. So they broke up the families, they mashed up the families. And, 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 and this is our wound. This is our wound on one side. And on the other side through the indentorship, there's a similar wound because they came and, 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 and what then happened next was, was a whole other drama. So we have to understand that, okay, this wound now is, is 100, 200, 300 years old, but, but we can do something about that today. How? Till and keep, because that's how we're going to heal the soul. By tilling and by keeping, we will heal the soul. Again, it yet? Again, 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 I get in it, I get in it. <laughs> you're, you're, hard you're, work, you're feeling it. hard work, but I'm getting it. You're feeling the feeling. I'm feeling the feeling. Your vibes in the vibes. 2021 people, get your Catholic news. You, you, you talk also about the container, God, Dad, and I want to go to flip this thing into our carnival will give right expression to our sexual energies, which will build chastity. You, boy, you're, you're putting it on the Father. It will build chastity in our families, families and our nation. And we will be a people who will do what is right because it is right regardless of what others think or say. Till and keep, Daddy. <laughs> Till and keep. What's your key message? Key message here, without a culture of care in our family, we will continue the ancient wound of slavery and indentorship and continually undermine the generation leading us to a lesser version of ourselves. Wow. Without a culture of care in our, in family. our family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will yeah, continue yeah. to per perpetuate the ancient wound of slavery and indentorship and that will continually undermine the generation, leading us to a lesser version of ourselves. I could say it different. No, 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 no. I, I take it there. I take it there. Pick up your Catholic news, everybody. Get into this thing. Action step. Ask St. Joseph in a real, real special way this year to intercede for your family and to ensure that we till and keep effectively. He did it for Jesus, you know. This man did it for Jesus, you know, okay? Jesus was son of God. You know, if you were, were dying and your kids were young and you had to figure out what to do in the absence of your presence here, you wouldn't go on and pick up some worthless character and ask him to take care. You're looking for the man who you believe is the best man that you could find who, who would hold the highest qualities possible if you wouldn't entrust your children to somebody. Correct? Correct. And we think God do. We think God do. Zip. Saint Joe. Joe Zip. Saint Joe, Saint Joe. So that's uh that's really um the the action step. If we if we entrust ourselves we will, we will, he will do for us as we did for Joseph. And now the scripture reading. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Humble service, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so too in Christ, we though many form one body, 
and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. And if it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Romans 12 verses 1 to 8. I thought this passage kind of summed up. Yeah. Well, first, you know, you have to, to give your, your body, you know, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Then if we do that, then we do true worship to God. Don't conform to the soul wound and its manifestations. I thought that was important. But on the other hand, we are all one body. And, and we have to understand each body has its part, but you have your role. And that's our truest identity. And this is the one passage that, that really talks about giving way to each other in Christ. It's a beautiful passage. Amen. Archbishop G, bless us with our prayer because we have plenty to dialogue and to think about. Father, we know your incredible love and we pray, Lord, blessings upon us. We ask, Lord, mercy upon mercy upon our lives. We know, Lord, the way in which the wound, our soul wound, has taken us wrong. But we know also your grace and your desire for us. We pray, Lord, for healing for our nation and healing for the fathers of our nation and the families of our nation and the mothers of our nation. That, that in this year of St. Joseph, we may come to new places in and through you. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. Joseph, and amen. Savior of the Pray Savior. for us. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for Thank us. you, Archbishop D. Thank you, Archbishop D. I just God want to give a little, a little message here. Ascension Press has a wonderful thing, Bible in a year. Go and Google it. If you want to, if you want to do something on the Bible, go and Google get Bible in a year, and and you'll see that every day you'll get you'll be given a video, and you can get an explanation of the whole Bible in a single year. If you're interested in the Bible and you want to do a little more learning on the Bible, brilliant opportunity. And guess what? It's for free. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Archbishop Jake.